Welcome, Red Cube listeners. You're very welcome to today's episode. I'm delighted to be joined by John Reardon, ex Shopify, ex Apple, ex Virgin Atlantic, and known as the godfather of remote John. John, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for not calling me the grandfather of remote. <laughs> no, no fear of that, John. No fear of that. So, John, listen, you're 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 very welcome. How are you these days? Very good indeed, thanks, and uh, delighted to get the opportunity to chat with you today, Carl. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Um, John, for the listeners, you might just give them a sense of your background and career to date. Yeah, um, I emigrated in in the early 90s, along with a lot of other people in Ireland at the time. And people of my generation will remember things like 17, 18, 19% unemployment. Um, and I went to the States and was lucky enough to end up in the aviation sector, um, culminating in a job at as, as VP of customer service at Virgin Atlantic Airways. And uh, in the early 2000s, um, I got involved in remote work because we needed to make some fairly significant changes in our customer service product. And uh, I came across a company that was doing remote work, and we shifted a lot of the Virgin Atlantic business to remote work. And Carl, this was at a time when um, there was no broadband. So people were doing it on dial-up. So the, the people who were working on the Virgin Atlantic account for this vendor, um, required they, they were required to have three phone lines, one for data, one for voice, and one for their own personal usage. So, and I, I say that because a lot of people will, will say, oh, I have to have one gig broadband if we're going to do this. Everybody has to have it. Hey, look, we were running a significant major international airline on dial-up. 20 years ago. So, you know, we need to think beyond some of the problems. So that was in the early, that was kind of 2002, three, and did that for a couple of years. And then I got a phone call from Apple who were looking to do, um, looking to build a significantly scalable customer support organization. This was around 2006. They were looking at it. I was too stupid to realize that down the, that they were actually in long-term planning for the iPhone, which came in in 2007. So About a year, maybe 13 months before the iPhone came in, we did the first ever um, remote employee handling a customer service interaction for Apple. It was May 2006, which is exactly 13 months prior to the the iPhone launch. And Apple then made the shift from being kind of a B2B company to being a B2C company. And the the iPhone was the the catalyst for that. Um, So I did that for a couple of years um, and ended up working in and around the Apple ecosystem for about 10 years. And I moved back to Ireland in 2010 with Apple, spent seven years at Apple running their customer um, support organization down in Cork. And about five years ago, I um, joined Shopify, which at the time was about 100 people in Ireland, all remote based. And uh, when I left in late 2000 or late 2021, that 120 had grown to just north of 800. So a sizable shift over the course of that, uh, of the five years that I was there. Well, John, and, and remote has clearly been with you, right? It's true to major parts of your, uh, of, of your career, if you like. And, and why have more organizations not embraced remote working? Like I know it took a, I suppose it took a, a global pandemic and all mm-hmm. of that, What's your thoughts like why it hasn't been more embraced before then? Yeah, it's 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 actually a really interesting point because, you know, you're either a genius for having done it 20 years ago or you're a big fool for being for having got the timing completely wrong. Um and I remember at one stage sitting down and and drafting a business plan in about 05 or 06 go out on my own to with the view to kind of starting a consulting group or a contract group to promote remote work. I'm very happy that I didn't do it because it was like, it was the timing would have been terrible. The idea would have been wonderful, but the timing would have been, I would have been very hungry for quite a number of years, I'm sure. But so to get to your point, like why, why now? Or, you know, why has it not been embraced before now? Well, you know, I think it's a bit crass to say, but you kind of never waste a recession or never waste a significant problem. And in this case, I would say, the pandemic has given us the opportunity to not waste the opportunity that this tectonic plate shift has brought. So a couple of things have been, and I'm just going to throw out four or five things really here. First one is, is 
office utilization. So let's take your general office that's in a central business district in country X, large, large city in a large country. Um, you have an office, you know, 168 hours a week. And the typical office in your central business district in that city is probably going to be occupied five days a week, 12 to 14 hours. So let's just say, let's just say 65, 70 hours a week. So you're talking about approximately 50% of the time the office is going to be used. Now, flip side of it is 50% of the time the office isn't being used and you're the CFO and you're actually paying for that. Okay. So now you have a, a situation that the pandemic brought upon us um, where most of the people were working from home. So suddenly your utilization dropped significantly. Do you hold on to that office? You, how then do you, even when the people are coming back, how do you judge the need for space in the future? So like if 20% of those people come back, do I still hang on to the office? And you still re recognize that's okay. You have a massive utilization gap and you have an asset that at best, if you jammed everybody in and you got everybody back, it's being used 50% of the time. So I think one thing that it unearthed is the great myth that is office utilization. It's not office attendance, it's office utilization. The second thing that was unearthed in this pandemic was what I call hidden deals. We all know of situations in every company where uh, Mary, she's a really good employee. We can't lose her. Um, she wants to work from West Galway. And look, just just, just don't say anything to anybody. We, we, we won't say a word. We get her up once a month into the office and just, just say nothing. Right? And there were hidden deals in all sorts of companies and just it was, wasn't talked about. Um, so that was the second thing was on earth. The second one was, was what I would call, um, I suppose, a lack of resilience. Um, because everybody was required to come into the office, uh, you had, and everybody was required to commute, you had a situation when, when there was a challenge or a problem, like, for example, we had a couple of storms there about four or five years ago, where the whole country shut down. And there was a very interesting scenario happened to us at Shopify on those particular days when the government shut down on two occasions for more, once for a day, once for two days, we actually had more than 100% show up at the office or show up online to work for Shopify. And the reason for that is the people who were going to be off that day or were going to be on holidays were dialing in saying, hey, I've nowhere to go. The roads are closed. Can I come and work? So what it showed us was that we had a level of resilience. Um, so we knew going into a situation like a pandemic, we were going to be able to do it. And another thing, one last one as well, that I think... Um, that it, it unearthed was um, biases. There's a ton of biases that all of us have. And I think the bias that would be, I suppose, landed on people of my generation, I'm in my 50s, you know, you look at that kind of male, pale and stale group of people that, that tend to be leading organizations. Um, and the bias would be, everybody has to come into the office because that's the way it's always been. And I think, We've had seen we've seen such a change in the last two years that that quote, that's the way it's always been. That needs to be just exploded. And it got exploded in the last couple of years. It's really interesting, John. I, I think the two storms was a storm of failure and we had a few inches of snow, if I remember. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the panic that caused for workplaces. How do we get work done? Absolutely. And like what I would say is that, you know, what we should do in future, we're always going to have something that's going to challenge the convention or challenge our work process. And the next time one of these happens, I would encourage anybody who's kind of on the path of leadership to sit back and go, how, am, what am I going to learn while I'm in this, in this moment? What are the things that I can detach myself from it, write down and learn? that I wouldn't have learned if this hadn't come about. And it's a really simple process. And I think it'll re it really will stand to people as they develop their careers. You know, any given moment gives you two opportunities. One, you can either, I suppose, step forward into growth or you can step back into safety. And I would encourage anybody and everybody to really take that step forward into growth. It's uncomfortable, it's hard, 
but it's a whole lot better than stepping back into safety. And look, you know, you probably know where I'm going to go on this one. With all of the companies talking about these return to office mandates, and mandate's a terrible word to use, but that's what's happening. What we're, what we're seeing happening is large companies are reaching back to 2015, and they're trying to drag 2015 into 2023. And what I would encourage people to do is kind of think a little bit about 2028, five years time. Where will the people that I want in my organization, what kind of a company do they want in five years time? Not what do I think I want, but what do the people who are going to drive the company forward, the next generation after me, what do they want in five years time? That's what I should be planning to do. So there's an element of sort of visioning around it, John. Um, yep. I, I think one of the things that sparked there, if you high performance sports are always talking about almost being comfortable in the chaos and being comfortable in the change because things will happen during a game or in a match. And then often I think sometimes we set up work or workplaces or the work to be very comfortable for people, right? And then something happens like what happened over the last few years. And we struggle a bit to adapt, to change. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's 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 why I would say never waste a, a moment of tension, stress, or significant change. And that's, you know, I kind of, as I mentioned, like if people could step back in the moment and jot down a couple of points as to what they're feeling at the time, and what they think is the, the the learning in the moment, and maybe even do it kind of for a couple of days afterwards, and do have that kind of um, kind of I wouldn't say a root cause analysis, but actually have a, a moment of reflection as close as possible to the time of change to see what they can do better in the future. John, a lot of the organisations listening, right? They're still at that starting stage, right? Trying mm -hmm. to figure out their way of of working, if you like. Um, of course, it's going to evolve. What what does successful remote working look like for you, John? I'm going to boil it down to probably one key thing, but really, there's a, there's two or three. The single the the best way to have a successful um, remote working culture or a successful work culture is to start by by saying we're going to be remote first. That mean that doesn't mean we're all going to be remote, but if you enable remote work and give people the opportunity to work remotely as well as hybrid as well as in the office, but you're setting it up so people can work remotely, you're actually setting yourself up for success. But there's this, there's a great you have to move this up a little bit higher. What is the most important thing to enable people to, or enable a company to be remote first, you have to trust employees and you have to have a culture of trust. And I would always say, go back to the moment when you hired an individual, when you sat in a room and put a contract across the desk to somebody, you trust that person to come in and help you to do the job. Do you then go and tell them every, do you then try to take their brain out and tell them everything they shouldn't do? Or do you actually want that person with those ideas and that level of trust? Are you going to instill trust in people? And I think what I would see is over the, over the past three years is um, a very slow and steady decline on what I would call the command and control culture and a nice steady uptick on inherent trust. So then you take trust and you move it down a little bit more. So the next most most important thing after trust is providing people a purpose as to what it is you're doing in the organization. So if you trust them to be the right people and you provide the right purpose and we agree on the purpose, probably the most important thing is then is to enable people by giving them a level of autonomy to do their job, which is kind of a, you know, uh, a, a a a bolt on to trust. So I would say trust, autonomy, and purpose are probably the three most important. And you know, one great book that was written, I'd say, about ten years ago, uh, uh, was a book called Drive by Daniel Pink, where he talks about those inherent drivers, and he actually talks quite extensively about trust, autonomy, and purpose. Mm. And we are seeing a lot more ownership and involvement, and. I think we're seeing more vulnerability as well on the behalf of leaders because that's a key part of, mm -hmm. of 
trust. John, you've been around many leadership tables, right? Any any thoughts on um, how to encourage leaders to ad- adapt remote or what are the sort of things they need to hear? Any any thoughts on that piece? You actually answered the question in the question. Um, it's about vulnerability. It's about honesty and vulnerability. Um, I had a, I had a kind of a bizarre situation when when in in Shopify when the pandemic happened the forty percent of the company was in the customer service arena and we were all remote. The other sixty percent of the company were office based. You know your your engineering, your product folks, your finance people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera were all office based and suddenly they had to go work remote. So they were doing something that was sort of first nature to us. We we just, that's just, that was our essence. And then they were trying to learn from us. And what I found was watching some of the, of my peers trying to learn that skill, the, the, the ones who were most successful were the ones who literally opened their soul and were really vulnerable about it and reached out and actually reached across the aisle and asked questions of their peer group and asked questions of their employees, am I doing the right job? The type of people who didn't succeed that well were the folks who were trying to make it up as they went along, right? And what it, the, vul- the vulnerability and the willingness to listen were the, to me, were the keys that actually, that, that cracked it for most people. Any key ingredients that Shopify had when it comes to remote working or, or I suppose any any key things that you felt were in place that made it sing for Shopify? Um, Shopify was very lucky in, like I just said there, they're very lucky in the fact that about 40% of the company were fully ingrained in a remote work culture. So we were, the other 60% were able to lean in on that 40. So we had a huge head start on most other companies. And like that's critically important. But and also the company about five years before that, the company uh, was in the process of changing an office in Ottawa. And to speed up the change, um, every employee was sent home for a month to speed up that change. So the company had kind of a shock to the system of five or six years beforehand where everybody was forced to work, whether they wanted it to or not, were forced to work from home for, for approximately a month. So that might sound like at the time a crazy idea, but the, there are these forced functions. And I think you referenced it earlier on when you were talking about sport. You know, you have to have these challenging and testing moments every now and then. And what you learn from that, you you never know when you're actually going to need that. And that was a great example where everybody. You know, the first thing I remember on in 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 March 2020 were. People at Shopify saying, hey, look, we've done this before. I know it was only for a month or so, but we've done it before. It shouldn't be too bad. So I would ask other companies now, like, what are you going to do in the next year or two to not necessarily shock the system, but can you actually bring a few things in to test to see how resilient you are? Another way of saying it is, what are you doing every year to actually kick that resilience tire? Really interesting. I found myself, I don't know about you, John, but over the last number of months, um, having conversations with, with organizations and I, I might ask them, are you working remote? And they would say, no, 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 we're hybrid. Um, which I find interesting, just that 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 response. Is remote hybrid? What's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a classic one. Yeah. Um, we all remember five or six years ago when you were the only person on a conference call who was on video and everybody else was in the conference room and you're in you're there you're on from a remote location and it was a terribly shitty experience you're missing out on everything right now that is not what i would call a democratic um experience but what the pandemic brought upon us is an understanding of the fact that that is a really shitty experience. So now you'll have situations where people are even going back into the office, but companies are requiring that everybody goes into a a different place in the office so that they have their own little, let's call it individual little Zoom picture on, on, so you don't have a group of people together. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is it was a shitty experience. 
So what companies have done to, to ameliorate that problem is they have, without actually saying it, they are, they are saying, okay, we're going to be remote first. But remote can actually be in an office. It can be remotely in, a, in an office in the corner of the office. But you are actually, you are on your own. So I think we really need to recognize and understand that remote um, remote can be used, can be weaponized by some people as, as, you know, somebody working in the deepest, darkest West Connemara and they're ne- we're never able to get to them and they're, they're never coming to the office and they're really, they're, they're not keen on the company and they're just reclusive. No, no, that's not remote work. Remote work, what we really need to talk about is flexibility. So whether it's remote, whether it's hybrid, what we have to focus in on is a, an element of flexibility that enables people to get the best work done. So, you know, you talk a lot about great places to work. What I would say is we need to talk about um, not places, but we need to talk about where do you need to go to do great work? And is it a place? And for some people, that place can be multiple different places in a week. I might I might like to spend two or three days at home doing deep work. I might want to spend half a day in a coffee shop, scratching that community itch with a bit of a buzz around me, um, kind of doing doing some stuff, but like not real deep work, but busy work. And then I want to actually be in an office and, you know, have that collaborative moment. Now, I could actually do the most incredible week by having a, a combination of all those three. Is it remote? Is it a co-working week? Is it hybrid? No, it's just damn flexible. And I think this is what companies need to think about is what can I do to provide the most f- flexible workspace? And the thing that underpins all of it is if I create a framework where I am embracing remote first, all the rest will follow. That doesn't mean that I'm charting the course to say we're remote only. Big difference. Big difference is right. And I, I, I don't know why, John, but I, I feel more creative if I'm close to a window and sitting on a sort of a higher stool. I don't know why that is. And for you, where, where do you feel at, at your most creative? Um, I'm lucky enough to have a, uh, a second home down on Mizzen Head. And I have the opportunity to, and you and I talked from it last week, and I showed you some of the views from there, and they're pretty, uh, pretty darn good. Um, I find that is the place where I can do the the best kind of thinking, the best deep work, and then I love interspersing that time, like you know, let's call it deep work time, with having a number of different, a number of conference co- video conference calls with people, um, so that I'm able to kind of make sure that I am still connected. So. It works for me, but you know, there's no point in 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 me bashing home what works for me. Everybody's got to work out what is the most appropriate um, circumstance for them to deliver their best product. Is there a way of doing that, John? Not at scale, but when with like a number of people. Um, yeah. How do you how do you get underneath that? How do you? It, it's interesting because there are as many different opinions on this as there are people. And I think the companies that are doing it really well are, like I said, the companies who are who say we're going to enable remote first for everybody. So we're just going to level the playing field and then going department by department or even leader by leader and finding out what works for that particular group. Because there are some groups like you, we can't say, you know, all accounting departments in every company are all around the world. They can all work from home. No, there, there are there are plenty of companies and plenty of divisions within finance functions where there's a deep interaction required and a collaborative, you know, face to face collaboration. So it doesn't work in some organizations. So any of these thick and fast rules, I'd say forget about it. It can all boil. It can boil down to smaller units and what works for that group. Now, one of the things that I'd like to actually embrace or I'd like to to detail on this one is that. There's a unique opportunity here for Ireland because the the relative size, the relative small size of Ireland is a superpower when it comes to embracing remote work because we can we can congregate and collaborate quite easily 
um, in a variety of different places in in the Midlands or in Dublin or wherever, um, and where you can get everybody together fairly quickly. Um, yes, you can then have everybody disperse and go whence they came. And that's a massively important uh, superpower that you don't have in larger countries, be it in the UK, be it in Canada, be it in, in the US, where that is incredibly difficult, incredibly costly, incredibly time consuming. So we need to take that opportunity and hammer home that point before anybody else gets up on that horse. We need to ride that horse hard. We're an English speaking country. We have access to the EU market. We're an incredibly attractive place and we have multiple um, uh, multiple nationalities clamoring to, to, to come into Ireland. We've got to use that and use that to our advantage. So I would say actually a great place to work is Ireland. We've got to shine those positives a lot more. Um, I know with your work with Grow Remote, John, you're, you're a big promoter of kind of um, making employment more accessible for rural Irish communities. Like just maybe expanding on that point, John, like what, what do we have going for us there? So, I mean, the, the, the most incredible benefit of, of a couple of people um, spending more time in, a, let's call it a, a more remote community, okay? You suddenly have a little bit more business going through the coffee shop and the corner shop. Um, makes a big difference. It may well be the difference between the post office or the bank branch staying open. Um, and it's quite likely to have a difference in um, the local school getting potentially an extra teacher. It may well be the difference between the local GA club being able to field a team or not. Those ones and twos don't, they're, they're not that obvious until you're actually in a community and you see multiple ones and twos from a variety of different companies. So the days when um, the, the, I suppose the economic growth of Ireland was based upon the minister for X, Y, and Z with a big scissors cutting a ribbon on a concrete box on the outskirts of a town. Those days are long gone. What we need to see are companies um, enabling, enabling their employees in Ireland to work in a more distributed manner and encouraging that. And that may well be a little bit further away from home base. And the other adva major advantage here, and uh, you know, I don't want to don't want to state the obvious here, but um, you know, there's what six and a half million people living on the island of Ireland now, and there was a time when we had eight million people living on this island. Okay, so we actually have, and there's a lot of houses that aren't being used, and they're not in Dublin, they're not in Cork, they're not in Galway, they're not in, they're not in the cities, they're not in our cities and towns, they're in the smaller places. So we have the opportunity to actually fill out the country a whole hell of a lot more. And that's why I think this whole concept of, of growing the remote base of Ireland is a massively important element. And when we chatted, when when you uh, when you showed me out the window at Mizzen Head and, and, and I got very jealous, John, um, you, you talked about the con connectivity you have on Mizzen Head. Yeah, it's 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 actually kind of it's wild that you know there I am uh, you know a mile and a half two miles from uh, oh, sorry kilometer two two kilometers from Mizzen Head, and I have a one gig broadband line, and all the way around the general area um, there's five G service. Now that just was that was not the case four five six years ago. So, you know I think we need to we need to um, stop being a bunch of whiny folks in Ireland and actually celebrate what we have. There's an, an enormous amount of growth happening with the national broadband, rollout of national broadband. And all you're going to hear about are people, the people who don't have it yet. But guess what? There's a commitment there. It's going to happen everywhere. Like when we electrified the country in, in the 1950s, not everywhere got it the first day, but everywhere got it eventually. So we're, we're getting there. I mean, we really are getting there. And there's a, there's a, there's a lot of positivity coming. Um, we just need to be smart about it. And, um, you know, the, the, the access to, to broadband in this country, when you compare it against um, many other countries of our size, um, I think we stack up and we stack up really well. Now, of course, that will probably piss off 
the, the cohort of people who don't yet have access. And I apologize. I'm not trying to, to rub your nose in it. But guess what? It It, it is coming. Yeah, it's coming soon. Um, at a macro level, John, uh, what do you feel is needed to encourage more remote? What can we do at a macro level? Um, I'll give you one basic one and one wild one. I suppose the basic thing is we need really strong, joined up thinking from a, a policy perspective. So there's a there's a, a document going around, um, a bit of legislation on the right to request remote work. Uh, and we need that to be not watered down so that an employer can say for, you know, silly, nefarious reasons, you can't work remote. It needs to be significantly employee friendly without actually causing a significant burden on the employer. And we need to we, we, that that's a that's a very important point. Um, a simple another simple one would be we have a remote work allowance of I think it's a three euros 20 a day. Um, if you can prove that you're a remote worker. But let me explain like an absolutely hilariously stupid thing. So Shopify, 100% remote company that has no office. Every single employee in Sh at Shopify and other com companies like, or employees of other companies that are 100% remote are required to prove to the government that they don't work in an office. If there's no, there is no office, so I couldn't be working in an office, but I then have to prove it by sharing utility bills and sharing this and sharing that for the sake of three euros 20. No wonder we're in a situation where not that many people are applying for this remote work allowance. So, you know, it's great for whoever, whoever passed that legislation, whenever it was passed to say, oh, I passed that legislation. But how effective has it been as a catalyst for change? Or how effective has it been to bolster your political career? And I would say it has not been effective enough to, to deliver change. And then the wild one I'll throw at you, and pardon the, the, the deliberate pun here, is the most spectacular change that we've seen in the country in the last 10 to 12 years has been the advent of the Wild Atlantic Way. And it has opened up essentially the west coast of Ireland from you know, from Donegal, probably all the way down around into the almost to the southeast into Waterford of that whole area. Um, it has brought it has it has kind of talked about that one area as being an incredibly attractive place for people to come visit. And what I'm saying is it's an incredibly attractive place for people to come and work. One of the things I noticed very early on at Shopify, people would come in from uh, outside of Ireland, come to work in Ireland and you're you're automatically going to be drawn to the cities because that's where people tend to go first. Once you embed in a company like a Shopify or like another remote or a remote company, and you realize, hang on, this is a great country. This is a great company. Mm, I don't know if I really want to live here in that this part of it. So where so you, you we saw people kind of kind of asking their peer group, oh, what's it? Where's a nice place to live in Ireland? And surprisingly, not surprisingly. The types of places that people were moving to were Tremor, Strand Hill, Lynch, Dingle. Why? Because they're beautiful places to live. The infrastructure is quite good. Um, the housing is far better than in the cities. So what that says to me is what we've done from a, a, a leisure perspective with the Wild Atlantic Way, we can and should do from a business perspective. So there are certain like a country that's done a really good job of pushing stuff like this is Estonia, um, a city that's done a really good job in the U.S. is Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, giving a ten thousand um, dollar essentially bounty for people to come in and work, to live and work in Tulsa. And what they found is that the people who came and lived, who moved into moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma to work, have stayed. There's an enormous stickiness to policies like this. So what I would say, guys, is the Wild Atlantic Way, we need to move it from being a leisure product to it being a cultural and business product that's going to help drive the next generation of growth. And it all fuels each other then. Absolutely. Oh, and by the way, it's an enormously helpful thing for whatever carbon footprint goals we're signing up for because less and less people 
are going to require. Oh, and by the way, more and more people living in places like that are going to get into that house and they're going to put up the solar PV panels and they're going to do their level best to to, you know, to ameliorate any costs, uh, extra costs they're going to have. And all of that helps. But we've got to have that forward thinking to, to try to create the level of encouragement that essentially commercializes the Wild Atlantic way, but not in the touristic way, in a more heuristic way rather than a touristic way. Absolutely, John. Um, did you do you feel more embraced by people now that we're all dialed into remote? I, I suppose maybe another way to ask it is, did you feel a little bit like the Mad Hatter um, oh. when it came to remote sort of years ago? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, look, look, I, I went from being a fool to being a genius and I actually changed. Not a bit. I was the same, like, it, and, and that, I'm, I'm not trying to say like I was, I was ahead of the game or anything like that, but inherently like how I came across remote work was, it was kind of bizarre. I, I overheard a conversation when I was at a baseball game in 2002 and somebody was talking about remote work and laughing about it and saying, oh, I should look at those people. They're at home and, you know, they're watching Oprah during the day and they're not working at all. Ha ha, remote work never works, blah, blah. And that was fine. And I remember driving home that night from Boston down to Connecticut where I was living. And the irony struck me that I was actually taking the Thursday and the Friday off, as in not going into the office, because I had budgets and reviews to write. And it kind of struck me, kind of almost like a road to Damascus moment that, and I never even knew the terminology to use probably for about 10 years afterwards, but I was doing deep work. I, I, I needed space and time to think about what I was doing. And the way I did it was I didn't go into the office, so I wasn't disturbed. I was able to lock myself away. I was fortunate enough I had a laptop, which not everybody would have had it back in 20, 20 odd years ago. Um, and that's how I came across this. So, yeah, I, I suppose that then I kind of, you know, I got heavily involved in it. But I I do remember doing a pitch for remote work to a company in 2008, 2009 in the US and being laughed out of it and being told that um, remote work is actually remote workers are remote shirkers. And I uh, yeah, I, that moniker stuck with me for a long time. And it really you know, I did see some change kind of 2017, 18, 19, but um, none of this would have happened. This goes back to one of the original questions. None of this would have happened unless you had this forced function of an awful pandemic that forced us to do something completely different. John, what do you do to relax? Or how do you well, relax? I retired with the view to relaxing, oh. but um, th so that was my plan. Um, but I got involved in a ton of things. Actually, almost all of them are, have a, a tie in to, um, to remote work. So um, I suppose, what do I do to, re to, to relax? Um, I am involved in, I, I cycle a bit. I walk, do, do, I walk quite a bit and run. Um, I try to keep fit and I try to read as much as I can. And the biggest curse that I have in my life that causes me not to relax is something I fool myself into thinking is a, a leisure activity, which is is scrolling through my phone to, to, to find out information that educates me. I wish to God I could actually treat myself like a teenager and that I could have a an, al an alter ego that would ban me from the phone. Um, and I, I wish I could just have had the discipline to turn my phone off for six, eight, 10, 12 hours at a time and pick up a book and get lost in it. So maybe that's my mission for the rest of the year. Read more and sc doom scroll less. Doom scroll less. It's only on a small level, but I since I took my emails off my phone, I, f I definitely felt a lot more relaxed, I think. It's it's small thing, but it's definitely worked. That is an excellent thing to do. I haven't got the balls to do that yet. John, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Really appreciate you joining us on the Red Cube. Um, you might be in a position to join us on June the 15th for our client away day on the Lairata State. Um, hope to hope to see you there. Um, thanks a lot for joining us, John. Thank you very much. 
Red Cube listeners, thank you very much for joining us today. Please subscribe to our podcast if you haven't already done so. And of course, leave us a review and tell us what topics would you like us to cover.